legal battles over who receives custody of children are always sad and tense experiences, even under the best of circumstances. But when religious zealotry and the willingness to commit a crime become part of the equation, it's a recipe for disaster. And in the case of two women, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, who suddenly disappeared in March of 2024, it was a disaster from which they would never return. Twenty-seven-year-old Veronica and thirty-nine-year-old Jillian were both known to be religious people. Jillian's husband served as a pastor at the Willow Christian Church, which is based in Nebraska, though he previously served under the same title at the Hugoton First Christian Church, which is just a short distance from the church that Veronica used to attend. While they were both very similar people, some aspects of their lives couldn't be more different. At the time, Veronica was in a fierce custody battle with her ex-husband's mother, Tiffany Adams. Tiffany had been granted custody of Veronica and her former husband's children, due to the fact that he was spending some time in a rehab facility. Veronica had just recently filed a petition with the court in which she asked to be granted more regular visits with her kids. Why Veronica didn't already have custody of her children, though, has never been explained. As it stood, Veronica could only see her children on Saturdays under the supervision of a court-approved person, who up until this point was chosen by Tiffany Adams. But on the 30th of March, Tiffany unexpectedly told that supervisor to take a couple of days off. Tiffany then contacted Veronica, who she knew would be traveling to her house to see her children that day, and told her that she needed to find a different supervisor for the day, since her preferred one would be unavailable. Veronica was blissfully unaware that this supervisor was actually unavailable because Tiffany had called and canceled. Pretty petty move if you ask me. Veronica then contacted Jillian Kelly to ask if she was available for the visit, and Jillian agreed to accompany her, since the kids were excited to attend one of their friends' sixth birthday parties, and she didn't want them to miss it. We don't know for sure how close Veronica and Jillian were, but based on the information I've been able to gather, the two likely only knew each other in passing. They were more acquaintances than friends, but I haven't been able to confirm this 100%. The thing is, there's been a gag order placed on this case by a judge, so some of the finer details are being withheld from the public for a few months, maybe even a couple of years or so. But we know that Jillian likely sympathized with Veronica since Jillian had four children of her own. She was known to do volunteer work in her community and clearly had a soft heart for other people, and certainly would have wanted Veronica to spend some time with her children. She also managed the children's program at the Hugoton First Christian Church, and so would have known that Veronica's children would have been very disappointed if they couldn't see their mother that day due to a scheduling conflict. Unbeknownst to the two women though, Tiffany, along with several other people who were associated with a religious anti-government group known as God's Misfits, had been brewing a nefarious plan to keep Veronica out of the picture for good. Jillian was nothing more than an innocent volunteer who was trying to help out a fellow mom, but the plan Tiffany and her gang of so-called misfits had been concocting would change the lives of their families forever. Tiffany Adams started getting her plans ready as early as the 13th of February when she traveled to a Walmart store in Oklahoma, where she purchased three prepaid cell phones that would later be used as burner phones. In the meantime, Veronica had filed a petition for more visitations with her children, and by all accounts, Tiffany did not take too kindly to this. But nevertheless, a hearing was scheduled to be held on the 17th of April. Just three days later, Tiffany Adams was known to have gone to a big R store, also located in Oklahoma, where she bought three stun guns, and I think you can probably guess where this is going. Both of these purchases would later serve as evidence in court. Exactly a week later, on the 30th of March, Veronica and Jillian set out from Hugoton to meet up with Tiffany and the children as planned, and they were known to have made it as far as Highway 95 and Road L, which is about five miles from the designated meeting place that was arranged beforehand. But then things started to get a little bit strange. While there hasn't been any public mention of how things unfolded exactly, police say that both women's cell phones suddenly dropped off the radar at 9.40 a.m as if they'd been switched off simultaneously or had both run out of battery, which was extremely unlikely. Investigators would later learn that just two minutes after Veronica and Jillian's cell phones went dark, the three cell phones that were bought by Tiffany 
were in the location of Veronica's car. And just over 10 minutes later, two of those phones were present at 43-year-old Tad Cullum's house. Cullum was also a member of God's Misfits. The two women never made it to the meeting point, didn't attend the child's birthday party, and never returned home that evening. But they wouldn't be reported as missing until the car that they were traveling in was found empty and abandoned, close to the designated meeting spot by Veronica's family. There have been several rumors spread online about how this plan unfolded, but there's never been any official mention of what exactly happened here. As far as the evidence takes us, it would seem as though the two women, Veronica and Jillian, were likely carjacked just a few miles before arriving at the meetup spot, with their car simply being left on the side of the road. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation sent officers to the scene, but it seemed from very early on that this wouldn't be your typical missing person investigation, since some very alarming pieces of evidence were found around the car. Investigators noticed trails of blood on the road and by the side of the road next to the car. Veronica's glasses were located a short distance away from the car where they were found lying on the ground, and worryingly, they were found next to a broken hammer. There were rumors that locals spotted a truck and or trailer near Veronica's car that day, but these rumors have never been confirmed by detectives. All we know for sure is that whatever happened to the two women on the side of the road that day, it didn't end well. As detectives continued to scour the scene of the crime for any additional evidence, Jillian's purse was finally tracked down, and inside, Officers discovered a pistol magazine, but the firearm was nowhere to be found, and it immediately became apparent that some type of foul play had occurred at the scene. A search of the immediate area was carried out, but neither Veronica nor Jillian could be located, and an investigation was launched. By this time, all three of the prepaid cell phones bought by Adams had stopped transmitting, likely because they'd served their purpose and had been turned off or destroyed. Having learned about the bitter custody battle that had been raging between Veronica and Tiffany, investigators decided to do a little bit of digging into Tiffany's life, and they obtained a search warrant for her cell phone, and what they discovered immediately sent alarm bells ringing. When her browser history was checked on the 1st of April, they found that she'd searched for phrases that included taser pain level, how to get someone out of their house, gun shops, and prepaid cell phones. This was not looking good. It would seem at this point that Tiffany may have planned on getting Veronica out of the picture for good, strictly so she could maintain custody of Veronica's children. Investigators then decided to interview people that they knew had associations with Tiffany. One teenager, the daughter of Cora Twombly, also a member of God's Misfits, had a lot of information to share, none of which filled investigators with any hope that these two missing women would be found unharmed. She stated that Tiffany Adams, Tad Burt Cullum and her parents, Cora and Cole Twombly, were definitely involved in the disappearance and that they likely ended the two women's lives. She also implicated one other person, but they've never been named and have never been charged. It was then that the police found out about the prepaid cell phones that Adams had purchased. Twombly's daughter revealed that the phones had been used by the group to stay in touch with each other during the events, as you probably expected. She also then admitted that they were all a part of the God's Misfits group. When asked about what had transpired that day, she stated that her parents told her on the 29th of March that they would not be home the following morning since they were due to go on a so-called mission. They never elaborated about what this mission was and Cora's daughter didn't press the situation any further. The following day, the couple returned home at about 12 noon. They were each seen driving a pickup truck, and when they entered the house, they stated that their plan hadn't gone quite as they had anticipated, but no one would have to worry about Veronica being a problem any longer. While it was never explained what they meant by this, their intentions seemed pretty clear. Cora's daughter took things one step further and admitted that the group had made an attempt on Veronica's life in the past, but couldn't carry out their plan since she didn't leave her house when they expected her to, essentially foiling their plans. On that occasion, they'd hatched a diabolical plan of throwing an anvil through Veronica's windshield while she was driving in hopes that it would look like an accident, in which an anvil had fallen off the back of a truck and ended her life. Thankfully, this plan never came to fruition. But what had happened to her this time around, assuming these so-called misfits were responsible? Well, what investigators uncovered next wasn't what anyone had expected or was hoping for. 
It had now become obvious that this was a premeditated kidnapping and that more sordid details would emerge. And so the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation contacted the FBI to ask for their assistance with the investigation. Having learned of the burner phones purchased by Adams, investigators used location services to ascertain the whereabouts and where they were last used. They learned that all three phones had been activated on the day of the disappearance, though this was done at different times throughout the day, as we mentioned. Two of those phones were at the Twombly house that day, and after the kidnappings were carried out, they transmitted from a pasture in the area. Officers then made contact with the owner of the pasture, a man named Jamie Beasley, who explained that Cullum rented the land from him and that he used it as a grazing area for his cattle. He added that Cullum and Adams contacted him either on the 28th or 29th of March, just days before Victoria and Jillian went missing, to ask if he could cut a specific tree down, remove a stump, and bury some concrete that he needed to dispose of. He also stated that he would be carrying out some dirt work using his skid steer, which is a type of earth moving machine. Beasley agreed to the work and added that he saw Cullum working on the skid steer on the 30th of March, the day of the incident. But when he returned to the area at around noon, the skid steer was no longer there. Investigators decided to take a closer look at the area where Cullum had been working, and there they made a worrying discovery. They noticed that a hole had been dug and then filled back in and covered up with hay, which struck them as strange. Covering up a hole is one thing, but in this scenario, there would have been no point in trying to conceal the hole. After all, Beasley had given them permission to dig in the first place. There was no reason to hide it. Beasley added that Cullum confided in him that investigators had suspicions that he may be involved in the two women's disappearances, and that he worried about the fact that his skid steer's tracks could be seen when the machine clearly wasn't there anymore. Beasley admitted that he told Cullum he would tell anyone who asked about the skid steer that he asked Cullum to do some tree and dirt work for it. But this was likely before he learned that Cullum might be involved in a convoluted crime plot. A further search of the area resulted in the burner phones that were bought by Tiffany being found. And the next daunting task was to find out what was buried in the 10-foot hole that Cullum had dug. And this wasn't a job that any of the detectives were looking forward to. The site was soon excavated, and to the dismay of investigators, a box freezer was extracted from the ground, and inside they found Veronica and Jillian's remains. They speculated that Cullum had covered the site with hay in hopes that it would attract his cattle, and this would cover the tracks left behind by the skid steer. But obviously his plan didn't work. Other personal items that have not been made public were also found inside the hole, though investigators have revealed that those items did not belong to either Veronica or Jillian. It's unclear if these items may allude to other crimes or if they're completely unrelated. They also found one of the stun guns, pieces of clothing, a saw handle, duct tape, and a knife at the scene. While it's never been revealed exactly how the women lost their lives, there's been a lot of chatter online about the girls potentially being held against their will for hours leading up to them finally losing their lives. And considering the various weapons police found near the burial site, these women were probably set up for an afternoon of terror unlike anything you or I could imagine. I came across a source or two online that claimed that both women likely lost their lives by being on the wrong end of a firearm. But I do again want to reiterate that this has not been confirmed by investigators just yet. I cannot stress this fact enough. I certainly don't want anyone thinking I'm spreading false information here. It's just the details of this crime and how it unfolded are severely limited at the moment. What we do know is that crime scene experts concluded that Cullum had dug the hole lowered the freezer down, and then covered everything in concrete and dirt in hopes that the women would never be found. But the truth had now been revealed, and five people were taken into custody. Tiffany Adams, Tad Cullum, Cole Twombly, Cora Twombly, and Paul Grice were all charged with the crime. A witness would later contact the police to report that Grice had arrived at his home on the 17th of April and started asking strange questions, including how long DNA would be present in the ground how DNA evidence is processed, and how someone could go about moving their family to Mexico. When he was interviewed, investigators noticed that he had a cut on one of his fingers, and when asked about it, he stated that he'd hurt himself while working on his pickup truck a few days earlier. When Cullum was arrested, officers noticed that he had crescent-shaped marks on his face that were consistent with those that would be made by fingernails. This indicated that either Veronica or Jillian may have fought against him while they were being kidnapped. 
Those who knew Cullum claimed that he usually kept his beard well trimmed, but recently started growing it out, likely in an attempt to hide the scratches left on his face by one of his victims. But this is purely speculation. Tiffany and Cullum's community members revealed that the couple had gained quite a reputation in the area, and that most people who lived there tried to steer clear of them since they were known to have a history of violence and were considered to be dangerous. No one ever explained specifically why they believed the couple were dangerous, but it seems pretty clear to see they were right. All of the suspects entered not guilty pleas, despite Adams admitting that she was responsible for ending the two women's lives, though she didn't go on record with these statements, so it's unclear if they'll be used against her in court, but I'd be willing to bet they probably will be. Investigators also noted that when Cullum was taken into custody, he was in possession of a rifle, ammunition, a bulletproof vest, and had prepared a go bag, also known as a bug out bag, that he would likely have used if he was forced to go on the run from the law. The pickup truck belonging to the Twombleys was seized after their daughter revealed that she was ordered by her parents to clean the vehicle after her parents returned home that morning. She and a friend did as they were told, but noticed a stain in the vehicle that they thought resembled blood. This discovery sent shivers down their spine, but it seems as though they didn't press the issue and left well enough alone, simply doing as the parents told them to do. Another member of the Twombly family then alerted the authorities to a gooseneck trailer that was being used by Cole Twombly, which was seen in the area where Veronica's car was found. This trailer was also confiscated and held as evidence in the case. As it stands, none of these suspects have received any sort of prison sentence, as the investigation is still ongoing. It needs to be said that all these people are innocent until proven guilty, but the evidence that continues to stack up against them, it doesn't paint a pretty picture of what unfolded that day and all over a custody disagreement. This crime not only robbed Veronica's children of their mother, but also caused the passing of a mother and wife who had nothing to do with the custody agreement whatsoever. Jillian was just doing her part to try to help out a friend who wanted to see her children. She was the very definition of an innocent bystander who just got caught up in a bad situation without even knowing it. It would later be revealed when asked on one occasion why Jillian had lost her life Tiffany stated that it was necessary because she supported Veronica and hence could not be considered innocent. So while Tiffany did enter a not guilty plea, this statement alone seems to indicate the obvious. In the meantime, the leader of the God's Misfit group, a man who calls himself Squirrel, has come forward to state that the group has completely distanced itself from the incident and believes that Adams serves a different God to his own since the God he serves would never condone such actions, and I certainly agree. Since evidence was found that Adams and Cullum were preparing to flee, the entire group was held without bail. This decision was certainly the correct one, since it was then revealed that the couple had, during a previous custody hearing, made comments in which they stated that they knew the path the judge walked to work every morning, suggesting that they may have been thinking about harming him as well. Since capital punishment is still a very real possibility in Oklahoma, the group may face the ultimate penalty when their cases go to trial. I certainly don't feel like giving these criminals the easy way out should ever be a possibility, but according to Oklahoma law, there's a very big chance that's exactly what the prosecution will try to do. While the investigators in this case should be commended for the amazing work they did to find Veronica and Jillian's attackers, we can't lose sight of the fact that two families are now left in mourning thanks to the actions of a clearly unhinged group of people that has absolutely no regard for human life. Veronica's children have been confirmed as safe, but they'll spend the rest of their lives with the knowledge that their grandmother, a woman who was supposed to care for them while their father was dealing with his addiction issues, chose to end their mother's life over some ridiculous custody battle. And that's something that no child should ever have to contend with. I don't think there's anyone on this planet who's capable of fully processing such a wicked amount of grief and confusion, let alone a few young children. This whole situation was not only damaging to Veronica and Jillian, but more than anything else, it has profoundly affected the lives of their kids and their kids' future children, and maybe even the ones after that. This type of trauma doesn't just go away with the people who witnessed it firsthand. Trauma trickles through generations making this a crime that won't soon be forgotten.
thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below or down in the comments to support the channel to see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.